everyone and welcome back to another Marilyn Manson case update. It has been a while since I've talked about either Marilyn Manson or Evan Rachel Wood and it's not because nothing's been going on, quite the opposite in fact. I have been working on a huge project trying to go through the hundreds of pages of legal filings that have been so far entered into the court system in the lawsuit between Marilyn Manson and Evan Rachel Wood slash Ilma Gore. And every single time I think I am close to done, something else happens and so it just keeps getting delayed and at the same time there has been a lot of other things going on that I think are really important to talk about as well. So today we're gonna do basically a little bit of like case housekeeping and talk about the text messages that recently were released between Marilyn Manson and Johnny Depp. These blew up the internet for a couple of days and I want to go through them line by line because I think there's a lot that people aren't talking about or maybe are misunderstanding and they might seem on the surface like just sort of non-important like who cares about people's text messages isn't this kind of like gossip but actually I think they have a lot to say and going through them in detail will take some time as it's a little bit hard to decipher exactly what it is they are saying to each other so let's go ahead and get into it and not waste any more time. So first of all let's go ahead and do some background on this because this was something that was just all over Twitter, all over the news for a couple of days and there is a little bit of a backstory here related to the Depp v. Heard case which I haven't really talked about on my channel at all. So basically what happened is somewhat recently there was a lawyer by the name of Andrea Burkhart that did a fundraiser to try and purchase over 6,000 unsealed documents from the Depp v. Heard trial. She was very easily able to fundraise this amount thanks to the support of the pro Johnny Depp side of the internet which is by far the majority and it cost over $3,000 at a cost of about 50 cents per page. Now the reason for why they wanted to obtain these unsealed documents after the case had already been finished was mostly because according to what they had said is because that Amber Heard and her lawyers had been going on TV and elsewhere online to say that more or less the trial wasn't fair because there was a ton of evidence that wasn't allowed into the actual courtroom and so naturally they wanted to release everything to the public to get people access to all of the real truth and be able to evaluate the merits of the case in as full a way as possible. However, I also think this probably, at least a little bit for some people, had to do with the fact that they were hoping to see actually more evidence that was on Johnny's side and maybe some things that made Amber Heard somehow look even worse and just kind of dig up some dirt a little bit because this is also entertainment at the same time for a lot of people and well it didn't exactly work out entirely as planned for the pro Johnny Depp side of the internet. So much stuff came out because it was over 6,000 pages that didn't necessarily make Johnny look very good. And this is not a video about the Depp v. Heard trial, so I'm not going to be talking about all of those other things. But in and amongst those thousands of pages were a handful that are relevant to us today, those aforementioned text messages. Now these were entered in as part of plaintiff's exhibits and they were just one of many among I think over a dozen different sets of text message correspondence that was potentially going to be part of the court case. However, Depp's legal team fought really hard not just to keep these text messages out of the trial, but also any association with Marilyn Manson, aka Brian Warner, according to Rolling Stone. Quote, despite Heard's team claiming that Depp's own lawyers had submitted those messages as trial exhibits, Depp's attorneys claimed that Heard wanted to include the communications between Depp and Manson to smear Mr. Depp under a guilty 
Pinky by association theory and to raise in the jury's mind that birds of a feather flock together. Now I find this phrasing interesting because it almost kind of implies that maybe Depp's lawyers see Marilyn Manson as potentially guilty or at least being seen as guilty in the public eye. It could also be the case that they were more considering how a jury would see something and what seems more believable to the average person that two guys who are well-documented, long-time best friends have similar bad things they've done in relationships or two guys that are long-term best friends where only one of them does really bad things and the other one apparently doesn't know anything about it. So I don't know exactly what their logic was there, but for whatever reason, they tried to keep this out of the trial. They were successful at that, but now that the documents were unsealed and then purchased and put out into the public, it is now up to the court of public opinion to evaluate them and see if they say anything important. So let's go ahead now and get into those text messages. Now, these are not the most legible texts on the planet, so fair warning, they have been redacted in certain areas, but I do still think they are worth going through. They start with Manson texting Johnny in 2016, sending him some image files, then stating, I got an Amber 2.0, poop deck pappy, we are gonna smooth up soon, yay. Now, at this point, we don't know who the Amber Heard 2.0 character is, but that will be clear in a couple of pages. Johnny replies that he's going through the border between the US and Canada and says, I'll be in jail soon. Love you, motherfucker. What song should I play with you? And what song should you play with us? The day that he asked this was July 8th, the same evening as his first show in Ontario as part of his summer tour with the Hollywood Vampires that year. Now quickly, I will also note that Johnny Depp and Marilyn Manson are known collaborators when it comes to music. I've talked about this before and they oftentimes will do guest appearances with each other when they are on tour. So hearing them talk about this with each other is not at all unusual, but the conversation continues on. Marilyn Manson follows up by saying, my new fan meeting Greek girl, <laughs> looks like you need it. Trust me, I'll send a pic. And then a line down from that, he says, 18, with you guys, Depp show with me. Now, before we unpack that first line, I think we need to correct an assumption I've been seeing people make about that second line. Because they are talking about a fan meeting Greek girl, a lot of people are assuming, oh my gosh, this person that he is wanting to send a picture of is only 18 years old. And I don't think that's actually what it is. I believe what he is referring to is actually the answer to the last question that Johnny asked him, which is, hey, what song do you want to play with me? And the Hollywood vampires have a cover song that they play called I'm 18, which is an Alice Cooper cover. There is also actually a recording of them playing this very song together a couple of days after these text messages were sent. So I am almost positive this is what they were referring to, not the age of the fan meet and greet person, but you never know, it could also be a double entendre, and that wouldn't be unusual with the way that they speak to each other. But continuing on, let's go back to the first line of that text, because it isn't great. You can make of this what you will in your own personal opinion, but to me, I do think it comes across as a little bit degrading and dehumanizing to apparently pick up girls from your fan group at your meet and greet events and then offer pictures of them, I hope with consent, but probably not, to your other male celebrity friends that you have. And I don't know, it just comes across as a little bit gross to me. And I think kind of shows the way that Marilyn Manson maybe thinks about at least his female fans. But after this, we have a fully censored text. So we don't really know what that's about, but I suspect that it is likely something along the lines of the Amber 2.0 that we saw earlier, judging by Johnny's reply. In and in and out, X. Loving Jew, my brother. I woke to two lovely photos of a man that seems to be capturing more than my attention. 
Thank you for remembering. These little tokens keep my heart warm in your absence. I miss you, my brother. We shall exchange precious bodily fluids. Don't take no shit. Most important is to stay calm and not give her what she wants, which is to make you scream, flip out, and feed her narcissism. Trust me, I've been reading a lot of material on that and sociopathic behavior. It is fucking real, my brother. My ex is goddamn textbook. Should have read this shit earlier. They're taking me to stage now. Hit me when you can. Big gay love, Zippy the Pinhead. Manson replies the next day, we are awesome. I'm gonna play Tom Wally, Wallet. Three songs and get straight paid. You, me, and the dingus makes three. Now, their text messages are esoteric at best, but I actually think what he is or who he is referring to here is Tom Wally with an E, who is an executive music producer that is currently being sued by Tupac's family for mismanaging their estate and supposedly, allegedly, embezzling millions of dollars. However, it goes beyond just a mere reference because apparently Howard King, who is one of Manson's lead attorneys, also is representing Tom Wally and basically saying that Tom Wally did nothing wrong. And also, again, Tom Wally is a music executive and he actually signed Marilyn Manson to his Loma Vista label back in 2015. And these text messages, which are taking place in the summer of 2016, are just a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two at the very most, separated from when Tom Wally, Wallet, took over as the person managing the Tupac family estate. So, makes you wonder what that Wallet joke is about, doesn't it? Anyways, I'm sure that will be investigated in due time if it ends up being relevant. But moving on, they have a short conversation about Joe Perry, who collapsed on stage in 2016 while with the Hollywood vampires. Manson responds, if you want to talk, I'm on my bus, but fuck, this is a fucked up year, but let's change it. Wonder twin powers activate. Then, months later in November, a few days before Thanksgiving, Manson sends a flurry of texts. Hey, you up? I may need to crash with you if I can. I am coming to the fuck pad tonight. Tight pants. hey -o. I'm gonna hobo spank you. Had a massive, dramatic exodus of the it. But I'm okay. Can't sleep. Just wanted to hear from my not gay boy. Depp seems to read, but not respond to these texts. And the following day, Manson says, You alive, damn it? Again, to no reply that we can see. There's another text the day after Thanksgiving that's also fully redacted, which finally gets Johnny's attention. He says, I send Starling right now? Manson replies a few minutes later. Are you back? I'm at Bates. But Lindsay pulled an amber and she filed a police report because that James Eha and her poor fat mom want to steal my money. Fuck them. I'm safe right now, but I may need to hide out if you've got a spare room. Johnny replies, let me know, brother. And Manson says, I will. Okay, so there is a lot going on in these messages. I think in the first text before Thanksgiving, that was actually maybe referring to Lindsay fleeing from Manson, or as he says it, the massive dramatic exodus of the it. And well, if you don't know who Lindsay is, Lindsay is Marilyn Manson's current wife. They were first spotted together sometime around 2010 or so, and following a short breakup in 2015, they were married in 2020. Lindsay is a complicated figure to say the very least when it comes to the allegations around Marilyn Manson. However, I have previously discussed how their relationship might not actually be so rosy. Statements from people who were around as personal assistants in 2015, 2016, things that fellow musicians have said about their relationship, 
photos of cuts and bruises and other things that don't necessarily seem entirely consensual. But yeah, Lindsay has never come out and said that she feels harmed by Manson or is afraid of Manson or wants to get away from him or is abused in literally any way. So how much speculation I think we should actually do is fairly limited, but we won't really know until she, if she ever, comes out and says something personally herself about how she feels in the relationship. But there potentially being a police report is huge huge news because his relationship with Lindsay is usually used as a defense because, hey, you know, look, he's known this person for 10 years. They got married. She's been around him through some of the lowest points in his career, in his life. If she is still with him, then that means he is able to have healthy, non-abusive, long-term relationships with people who are in their 30s, as she is. I don't know how old she was when they met, but she's, I think, in her mid-30s now. And that just really pokes some holes in a lot of arguments about the way that Marilyn Manson does relationships in general. However, I can't actually verify if there is a police report or not because in California, police reports are not a matter of public record. So I imagine the only way we'll probably ever see this if it's actually real is if somehow it becomes relevant to the trial and it gets brought in that way or is part of some other kind of legal proceeding. But I wouldn't really get any hopes up about that. However, just the fact that Manson is saying to his best friend, hey, my girl went and filed a police report against me. Can I come hide at your place? That, that really says a lot to me. And he also doesn't stop with the police report. He says that her family is money hungry and he uses an antiquated Korean War era racial slur against James Eha of the Smashing Pumpkins. James Eha is the husband of Lindsay's twin sister, Ashley. And if you've been following along, it really shouldn't be a surprise that Marilyn Manson would like to use antiquated racial slurs as part of his texts with his best friend because he has something of a history of that. As we have discussed before, he collects Nazi memorabilia to the point that earlier on in his career, he was actually sued by a fellow band member who alleged he was squandering their money on collecting said Nazi memorabilia. He has no problem throwing the N-word around. He thinks that racism is a made up stupid word and he also allegedly penned a letter in which he lamented that he was a slave to the Jews. So we're gonna see more language like this pop up in these text messages. On the next page, on the 26th of November, Manson starts by saying, I like emoticocks. I think in reference to emojis for some reason. Then there's a completely redacted message that I think might contain the word restraining order, which causes Johnny to react. Where are you? Is she there as well? Keep a distance and speak as little as possible to her. I gets in car and comes to get to you? Manson replies, I'm at home. She's at sister's house. I should be cool here, but I got the cats and they are rascals. Where are you? And where should I go? Because I don't have work today so I can hide out wherever you gots, my brother. Johnny, I'm at the old house, 1486. I have a conference call in 40 minutes. I know sleeps. I know taking the drugs. Let's make noise. A few minutes later, Manson replies, I talked to Tony, his manager who dropped him in 2021 following the allegations coming out. But this is fucked. She filed a restraining order, said I beat her up, and gave the cops my address, and said that I have drugs here, so I am ready to book out of here. And let's talk about that restraining order for a second, because as I said previously, police reports are not a matter of public record, so you can't 
find one by just searching for it online. However, restraining orders actually are. And as far as I can tell in my searching, I have not been able to find any restraining order related to Brian Warner or Marilyn Manson or under Lindsay's name. So I'm not actually sure if this is a restraining order that actually existed. However, there is a case that for some reason the restraining order might be sealed, in which case it wouldn't show up on a public search, but who knows, right? It's entirely possible that she said she was getting a restraining order or intended to get one and then didn't follow through on it for some reason. So, you know, again, we don't really have the full details here, but that's, that's just my thoughts about it. But yeah, he just seemed really frantic and his text messages keep going, so let's keep talking about them. Continuing on the next page, he says, I'm hoping that the Popo ain't coming after me. I'm at Bates, finishing the last track, hopefully. But there's room for one more. When are you in LA? And because the revelation of the restraining order wasn't enough, this is when things get outright bizarre. Johnny replies, Kooky kitty indeed. Let us dine and quench our thirst, my brother. It is my opinion that we will need a cave of some sort. I am thinking Desaad styly. Miss you, and I'm here whenever. Love you long time, Jimmy Drip. I'll text you tomorrow. Let's have our own solo, but no gay stuff with us. Just get the guy in front of the Chinese theater and someone from any goth band and buy them as slaves and make them recreate our formative years in an opera, a street opera, and we shall tussle with the young lasses. Double Dots Girl gets here on Thursday. We can have clandestine man times, cat wrestling. Then the Fanta shall send us into out her face space. Boom, TM. And holy crap, where to even begin unpacking this? So what Johnny is referencing is he says they need something de Saad style, as in Marquis de Saad, as in the guy that's the namesake of the term sadist. And then Marilyn Manson takes it a step farther and says they need to recreate Sala, which is an interpretation of Marquis de Sade's very famous work, 120 Days of Sodom, that is set in fascist Italy. It involves a lot of kidnapping of teenagers and torture and sexual assault and rape and finally most of them end up getting killed in just awful ways by the end of the movie. It is one of the most controversial films ever made and listen I talk about BDSM for a living, okay? I get dark humor, I get dark fantasies, I, like that all makes sense. However, I do think it is a little suspicious that in the middle of a conversation about your girlfriend getting a restraining order against you and filing a police report, you would go, hey friend, you know what we need? To recreate a pedophilic torture porn movie set in fascist Italy. I just, I, again, it could be dark humor, I'm aware of it, but I, I think putting it in the sus category is more than justified in this case. And as a brief side note, again, because they talk in very esoteric ways, I believe the term Fanta that he's using in that might be the abbreviation fuck and never touch again, which, wow, if he means that, again, another couple points in the Marilyn Manson talks about women in degrading and dehumanizing ways category, I think. They continue to talk, quote, do the call, I'll sneak over and make no noise and then hide. I got my guy Judd, an ex-assistant accused by Louise K. Bell of committing doxing and harassment, can drop me by after your call. I'm just packing up a few underwears and whatnot. Don't worry about my call. Then the following year in 2017, I have a leg hands free crutch. Looks like a pirate leg. Did that lawyer approval get squared away so I can release the shit? I want to say this to the press or on Twitter because it is real. Am I love my brother? Johnny Depp is by far the most caring person a wretch like me could ever know. He is selfless in his love of his close circle of true friends. He is a great, great father. 
and if anyone has the ignorance to compare his acting to paparazzi pictures, then you are tourists. He invented paparazzi, being real, real fucking amazing. My best friend has never been afraid to be himself. He has known, and now I hope he is certain, that scabrous vultures are trying to eat his unkillable corpse. However, his artistic heart and God-giving acting abilities go beyond film. He allows dim-witted doubters to assume his demise. That is his greatest gift. Watching the rats jump ship and being a champion and looking handsome as fuck doing it. I want to add that an actress he was involved with referred to me as a homosexual because Johnny and I have been friends for years and got matching tattoos. I thought it was an ironic joke, but I watch my best friend be called terrible slurs, and I respect him as a gentleman for not saying the truth that I would love to tell the world, but as his friend and his daughter's godfather, I believe that family matters should be respected and not be a device to climb your way to the bottom. And this, but I won't unless you are against it. I fucking need to save this fucking landslide. I knew it was coming that. He then sends Johnny an attachment of an image with the final line from me for you, with no further texts and no replies from Johnny with what he thought about the statement, at least that we know of. That's it. So what I think is the most important thing as it relates to Marilyn Manson's lawsuit and the other allegations against him is the fact that apparently at some point in 2016, Lindsay was, according to these text messages, so fed up with Manson's behavior that she at some point went out and filed a police report against him and then at least thought about or threatened or possibly even actually got a restraining order against him. And that means there's been at least one time that she thought very strongly about leaving the relationship. But this isn't the only time something like this might have happened because in February of 2015, there was a now quite famous concert appearance that Marilyn Manson did where I think at the beginning, though it could have been maybe during a break between songs, he read part of a breakup text message out loud to the audience in which at one point part of what it said was i hope you trick every dumb girl into thinking she got the golden ticket now he doesn't say but it is most likely the case that this text he reads out is from Lindsay. not sure who else it could be but there's always a possibility i guess but assuming that it is Lindsay's, that marks two times she at least wanted to or attempted to leave that relationship. And of course, on again, off again, relationships are a thing. Messy relationships are a thing. Messy people in relationships that can't decide what they want are a thing. However, I wanna highlight this because on average, it takes abuse victims seven times to actually leave their abuser. And we don't know if Lindsay's actually abused or not. We don't know if she would consider herself to be an abuse victim, and we won't know until and if she ever comes out and says for herself, hey, what happened to me wasn't okay, this was abusive, I'm a victim, or whatever way she would choose to phrase it. We don't know, and I'm not saying for sure that she is an abuse victim. But it is so often the case that people look at these allegations and go, well, he obviously looks crazy, so why were you ever even dating him in the first place? Or if things got so bad and you didn't like it, why didn't you just leave? Or why would you ever move in with him if you didn't like what he was doing with you? Or a million other variations of that. And it is so hard to leave an abusive relationship once you are trapped in that cycle. It is like trying to safely pull yourself alone out of a riptide when you can't see where the shoreline is and your lungs are already halfway filled with water. It is, I don't know why this is making me upset, but it is so difficult to leave and I wish that people had compassion and openness for people that haven't yet left relationships that could be hurting them because 
if you are closing that door in their face and saying, well, if this was serious, you should have already just left because now they're internalizing that message and going, oh, they're right. If it wasn't actually that bad, like why, like, you know, why, like, why would I want to leave if it wasn't really that bad, you know? And if it was that bad, I, I would have already left, right? They're probably totally right. And I, like, maybe, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe it's all really in my head. Maybe when my abuser apologizes to me, that's what's real. And I'm just overreacting. And it just makes things so much worse when the messaging we have towards victims is that, the only way they can really be victims is if they leave immediately, I guess, before the abuse ever actually really starts to occur. So yeah, I just, I just want to be open to that idea because as I said earlier, and as I will now go into more detail about, it's not just the case that the only time there's been hints of their relationship being bad is in these text messages. There have been Polaroids and other photos, some of them from around this 2015, 2016 time period that show what I would term not likely to be consensual marks on her body. Again, I talk about BDSM for a living. I am very familiar with the differences between bruises and wounds that come from DV and things that are more likely to come from consensual kink. And it is not typical that you would, for example, have really deep bruises on your upper arm or around your shoulder bone and your clavicle as part of a consensual kink dynamic or have wounds on your hands that are openly visible that possibly look like defensive wounds or things that are plainly visible on your leg, on your outer thigh, it's just, it's not something that I would typically call or would typically would assume would be consensual kink marks. They could be. Of course, it's all in the realm of possibility, but based on my experience and my interpretation, I don't think they entirely are. And even coming from other people, even though Lindsay hasn't spoken for herself, we have statements from people who were around at the time, like Dan Cleary, who said both in 2020 and in 2021, that when he was a personal assistant for Marilyn Manson, that he saw Lindsay being physically and mentally slash emotionally abused by Marilyn Manson. We also have had statements from Otep, somebody that was a big fan of Marilyn Manson, that is also a famous fellow rock star, that said that Lindsay would call in the wee hours of the night and say that Manson was being destructive, that he was high or on drugs and he was yelling at her and accusing her of cheating on him and throwing things at her. Things that we have seen repeated in many of the other allegations from people like Ashley Morgan Smithline or Esme Bianco or Evan Rachel Wood or many, many other people. Again, there have literally been dozens of people that have spoken out against Marilyn Manson, a good portion of which are people who say they directly experience things from him. In fact, in January of 2015, there was a profile done by Rolling Stone just a couple of weeks before the infamous concert where he read out part of that breakup text message. It had some interesting details in it, like, Maybe they've been having some relationship issues with lyrics like, don't bring your black heart to bed. When I wake up, you best be gone or you better be dead. He's not necessarily referring to her, even though they did come from a text he sent her. It also repeated details that we've heard in other places over the years, like the fact he likes to keep his home in the 60s and also that it is apparently pitch black dark. So, does this mean that Lindsay has been going through all of the same things that some of the other accusers have gone through? Not necessarily, but there certainly seems to be something of a correlation from the evidence that we currently have. And I believe I've already hinted at this, but if you've been following the case closely, you likely already know that Lindsay is something of a controversial figure. 
because there are allegations that she has potentially been working to discredit accusers and attempting to blackmail them and she is largely seen as someone that is a bulldog for Manson, a defender of Manson, and of course she's never made any statements to the contrary, at least in the last several years, other than maybe a little like snipey comments when they were in the middle of breaking up or soon after a breakup or something. So it would be easy to go, okay, well, she's blaming the victims. She hates all the victims. She can't be a victim herself. Look at everything that she's doing. If she was a victim, she wouldn't behave this way. And being a victim is complicated. It is very, very hard to be in a relationship with an abuser. And it is not an uncommon survival tactic for people to start to identify with their abuser and defend them in the public or to other people and in fact believe that they need you, that they need your help, that they're actually a victim and that it is your job as a good partner to defend them. And I don't think it's entirely out of the question for Lindsay to maybe be in a similar position. I don't really think it means anything in particular that they've been together for so many years or that they got married or that she was recently paraded around in public and photographed by the paparazzi for the first time in a very, very long time. That doesn't mean anything. People are in abusive relationships and marry their abusers all the time maybe because they think that it will save them from more abuse. It could also be the case that maybe she was abused in the past and isn't anymore. We really genuinely do not know what is going on there. And again, I'm gonna repeat it, we won't know unless and until she comes out and says what her story is. And when it does, I hope that we believe her. And I hope that if she is someone that is is trapped in this abusive relationship that she might be in that she at one point finds the strength, finds the security, finds the stability somewhere to be able to leave in a way that's safe at a time that's right for her. Because I don't make these videos because I want to make money. I don't make these videos because I hate Marilyn Manson and I, I want revenge on him and I just like puritanically believe anyone that makes any kind of accusation about anyone. That's not what this is about for me. If you guys know my other content, you should probably know this, but I care a lot about healthy relationships and about consent and about people being happy. And if someone's not happy, if they're being harmed in a relationship, I just want them to be able to leave. And then if they choose to speak out about their negative experiences, that people believe them. That's really it. That's what it is for me. Anyways, those are the text messages. That was a doozy. And yeah, I don't really know what's going to happen with Lindsay. I, like, can you guys imagine if she ends up, like, being part of the defamation trial at all? If she ends up, like, actually being in court? I don't know. I mean, honestly, you could take a cynical view that part of the reason they got married is because they were anticipating some kind of legal proceeding happening. I don't know. It was apparently a secret wedding that Nick Cage attended, so... You know, anything's really possible, I guess. Who's to say? Who's to say, right? So, anyways, those are my thoughts. I have so many other updates about all of this to go through. I have, like, four different video scripts I'm currently working on. We're going to be going over Evan Rachel Wood talking about Amber Heard. We're going to be going over some interviews that the director of Phoenix Rising, Amy Berg, did. We're going to be talking about some accusers that we've actually never covered before, whose stories I think are really important. We, we've, we've got a lot to go through, okay? We've got a whole court case worth of documents to go through as well. That's a big one. So in probably the next month, there's going to be probably four or five different videos about all of this that's that's going to be coming out. So if you want to make sure to not miss those, please do subscribe. That's down below if you guys don't know. Thank you all so much if you are already subscribed. And I would also love to hear your thoughts in a comment down below. If you do have any thoughts, just be respectful, be kind as always. And if you guys do want to support what I do, because trust me, YouTube does not like that I make these videos. But if you want to support me, you can go over to Patreon. A link to that is 
down below. Thank you so, so much. If you do already support over there, it means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.